But first, we have David Bonson here with us, founder and managing partner of the Bonson Group. David, great to see you here in person. Desperate for your thoughts on RFK Jr. And really from a policy perspective, he wants to come in and shake up the old guard. Can he do it? Well, uh, there's very little he can do because it's not legislative, but there's a lot he can do regulatory. It has the largest budget of any department. Um, right. I think that his confirmation is 50-50. There's some I think are less than that, many that are a shoe in His is right there 50-50, but let's assume he gets in. I, I get a kick out of the idea that some of the stress today in some of these drug makers is related to RFK. The Nasdaq's down 450 points. Is he hurting semiconductors? I mean, <laughs> I, it, we're always trying to find cause and effect on these things. Uh. Ultimately, uh, I think that there's stuff he can do on a regulatory basis. But a lot, what people don't realize is this is not President Trump's most animating stuff. Snack foods and vaccines are not the things that most animate him. Mm. I think when you look at tax and regulation, trade and immigration and energy, those are the areas that matter to the president the most. I hate to say it, Jackie, snack foods get us animated. They do. But some, and while they may not be that exciting, some of these picks are very polarizing. Oh, and yeah. so you think about Matt Gates for attorney general or RFK Jr. for HHS. And there are sort of two segments of the population here, and we saw it in the popular vote. You've got some people who are looking at this and saying, who are these misfits that Trump is trying to appoint um, to his cabinet and to these key positions? And then there are other people, 75 million people, mm -hmm. by the way, out there looking at these names and praising them and saying, this is exactly what we need. Jackie, I don't think that there's 75 million people saying that about all of these picks. I think they said it about Trump. Yeah. But I don't think they're saying it about some of those picks. Do you see the difference? I, I guess why I'm looking at it saying some of these confirmations are wildly popular. Some are more controversial. And what matters to the people, the, the 75 million you refer to, was President Trump. I'm not sure everyone is equally animated by either mm. RFK or Matt Gates as examples. Can I stay on RFK for a second? Because I, I actually find this fascinating. The topic of health and what we eat was a big issue on the campaign trail. And people really seem to respond to it. Now, now we've got RFK as the nominee. And one of the big things we're talking about is, well, are we going to say goodbye to the snack foods and the chemicals and the dyes and all this stuff? And maybe I'm stepping on a landmine here, but I don't know if America actually wants as much regulation on those things as we think is going to come with an RFK nomination. So. Yeah. Are, are like, is this big government food regulation that we're going to get with him? Yeah, the idea of big snack, big pharma, uh, and 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 big fast food are, are new people we're supposed to be all afraid of. It bothers me a little bit because I am more of a limited government guy. I don't think the right was really thrilled when Michelle Obama talked about some of this mm. stuff. Uh, Michael Bloomberg wanted to regulate the size of soda pop in New York, and people made fun of it. So, look, um, I don't need the federal government to tell me that too much but potato chips is unhealthy. I was aware of they're that They're not going to be telling you that. They're going to try to take some of the chemicals out of our food that are poisoning people who are getting cancer, diabetes, and heart disease. Yeah, so a I little think, bit different than how much soda am I drinking per I, I think that that is a fundamental question about the way people eat, the decisions they make, the choices they make. If they're going a, the federal government being in charge of diet, what's the limiting principle? Mm. I mean, I mean, really, when you talk about heart disease, cholesterol and so forth, we're not just talking about chemicals that are known to cause cancer. We're talking about decisions over one's life. Uh, are we going to mandate exercise? There's a lot of, of need for how many discussion. times a week can I eat Kraft mac and cheese? Can I eat it <laughs> once a week, twice a week? It's Brian's burning question. It's, it's, this is a big question. And it's one I'm sure you've wanted for your whole life. Washington, D.C. to answer for <laughs> no, you. That, that's my that's, that's the big point. issue. How much does D.C., any re, any regime, any administration get to say about those I, I'm not sure where conservatives got the idea that Washington, D.C. was qualified in this area. Now, look, I think they can get out of the way in some areas. I'd like D.C. to do that. And that's where I think President Trump can be very effective. That's what this government efficiency thing is meant to do. Right. Where can they find room to peel back government regulation? We're talking about adding regulation, and we're talking about it in some things that are not big priorities. Look, we talked last week about my love-hate relationship with President Trump at times. I don't think he's animated by this stuff. I think he's going for low-hanging fruit. Uh, Tax, no, regulation, okay. energy, the important stuff. Okay. I want to talk about another big agency out there, the Federal Reserve. We've heard from Jay Powell yesterday, and he had interesting, after we got some of the producer price index and the consumer price index data that was hotter, I think, than many people thought, he sort of poo-pooed the idea that Fed rate cuts are guaranteed and maybe even said December is maybe closer to 50-50 now at this point. How much does that fold into then 
policy making from a president who likes low interest rates, but a Federal Reserve that says we actually may now not be cutting. Well, there is no question that President Trump's going to be pushing and jawboning and putting on social media his desire for them to be cutting. Mm. And it just so happens that I think his interests are going to be aligned with Chairman Powell. I think that they will be cutting and he will, in between cuts, say things like, oh, we have to look at the data and kind of give markets a pause. That's important for central bank credibility. He can't just come out and say, hey, we're going to do all this and and you know it's guaranteed. The market generally drives the Fed, not the Fed driving the market. But uh, at the end of the day, I think that they're going to be going a quarter point per meeting for the foreseeable future because they want to get it down to 3%, which what they believe to be the natural rate where they're not actually affecting a tightening of monetary policy. And guess what? That helps. Payments on our interest. Mm -hmm. Yes, it does. Are lower. Which is eating up a ton of the budget right now. Hundreds of billions of dollars. What do you think about the dollar right now, the strength that we're seeing? Some of that is positive with respect to the other currencies. It shows that king dollar is still the king. At the same time, it's not great for corporations and it hurts profits to a certain degree. Will there be enough growth coming from the Trump economic plan that will offset that? Well, uh, President Trump wants a weaker dollar, and he's always said that. And it, when you say corporations, the corporations that export to the yes. world, it's not good for them. Corporations doing the opposite, that have a lot of import business, it's good for. But we have a lot of multinational companies in the U.S. that don't like this the dollar this strong. I think that's President Trump's biggest leverage of China. I don't think it'll end up being tariffs because they're oh. too disruptive. I think he's going to really rally hard for them to revalue their currency higher, devalue the dollar. Uh, Scott Besson who's one of President Trump's considerations for Treasury Secretary, he's calling it a Mar-a-Lago Accord, similar to the Plaza Accord in the 80s, a currency deal. Really quickly, uh, Gary Cohn was on the Clayman Countdown yesterday saying tariffs are Trump's biggest bargaining tool with China, but you disagree. I just don't understand how they're a bargaining tool when the person you're negotiating with knows that they're a bargaining tool. So these are better negotiators than I am. Maybe they know something I don't know. But if I know it's a bargaining tool, I don't know how it's a bargaining tool. Most importantly, they've held it up as a revenue tool. And see, if it's a bargaining tool, it can't be revenue. Right. It it either is going to be good for American manufacturers, which means it doesn't generate revenue. Yeah. Because we're not importing, getting tariffs, right. or it isn't helping American manufacturers, and it is generating revenue. So it can't be both at the same time. I, I agree with that. I think if, I think you can know the other guy's bargaining tool, and it still be effective against you. Like if if I do this, he's going to do that, and I don't want that. It's more of a sure. threat. Yo, it's a threat, and it's a blunt instrument, and I think it's a better threat when it's used selectively than broad based. Mm-hmm. Because here's right. the thing. I don't Canada, Mexico, Europe, China, they know he can't do it to everyone. It would destroy the American mm. economy. And they know he won't do it. But targeted at China? Well, they have to. You don't want to be the guy it. he does it to, though. That's the thing. That's right. right. So maybe you, you behave. And that's where there's leverage with China. Yeah. Okay. David Bonson, so smart. Love talking with you on a range stuff. of stuff. Thank, Thank you. you. Thank you.